Okay, let's get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We may be joined by a few more. Um, I'm Cole Harrison, Executive Director of Mass Peace Action, and we're here to talk about state legislation, how we can use state legislation to push for peace and justice issues. Uh, Mass Peace Action, together with our partner groups, uh, have filed six bills in this session of the legislature, and we're also going to talk about two bills that we oppose. Uh, so we're going to cover eight bills in all today and tell you about them. We're going to hear from legislators and advocates about why they're important and what they would mean if they were to pass. Um, to mention a couple of the things, we have a sign-up form we request you fill to say what you can do for these bills and think about it during the session, but I'll put in the link now. Uh, that asks you to tell us what bills are most important to you and what you can do for them. It gives you a few options of ways you can help out. Um, second, we have a lobby day tentatively May 23rd on the nuclear bills. Three of the bills are about change to nuclear weapons issues, and we're going to do a lobby day on May 23rd, so please sign up for that. Uh, finally, there's other bills we support besides the ones we filed ourselves um, on issues ranging from uh, immigration to economic issues, um, uh, uh, prison and criminal justice issues, and more climate issues, so we have a list of those. Uh, we're not going to talk about those bills in any detail today, but I, I want to give you a link to them. And we will come back to those in our email messaging as they come up for action in the legislature. Uh, um, so, uh, gee, our first speaker is not here yet, but I'm still going to pass it over to... Maybe Jonathan's calling the person. Um, I'm, I'm going to wait just a second until Jonathan gets off the phone, see if he has word. Otherwise, we'll go to the speakers that are here and get, let them go first. Hey, Jonathan, any word from Senator Pacheco? Uh, he doesn't, his, doesn't answer his phone, so. Uh -huh. All right, well, uh, maybe you can keep trying, and why don't we um, go forward with the speakers that are already here, unless you want to make some preliminary remarks yeah. now. Right. All right, so why don't we go over to Glenn, and you can introduce the speakers on the nuclear segment. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Glenn Cody. I'm co-chair of the Massachusetts Peace Action Legislative Political Committee, and I'll be moderating the section we have on the, this event about uh, bills in the state legislature that deal with nuclear issues. And so we have uh, on deck um, Ira Helfand, Lindsay Sabadosa, Mike Conley, and Tim and Wallace. And is Ira here? I believe I did see him. Ira's here, yes. Yes, awesome. Um, so first up, we have Ira Helfand, who joins us now to discuss the Back from the Brink campaign and the resolution bill that I believe is in the Senate. And uh, take it away, Ira. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, so the Back from the Brink bill in the current legislative session is S-1487. It's a Senate-only bill at this point because it's a resolution, It uh, and the kind of resolution that it is, uh, it can only be considered by the House if it's first passed by the Senate. So the focus initially will be trying to get the Senate to uh, to pass this. It is referred to uh, a joint House-Senate committee, which is interesting, uh, and currently it is sitting before the uh, Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security, although um, there is an attempt being made to move it to the um, Emergency Preparedness Committee, which only has 10 or so pieces of legislation before it, as opposed to the 300 odd pieces before the Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee. Uh, this is part of a national campaign of similar resolutions that have been passed now by um, municipal uh, uh, city councils, town meetings, in um, about 65 cities and towns across the country. Uh, we've also had similar resolutions adopted by seven state legislative bodies, both houses of uh, the Oregon and California legislature, uh, the Maine Senate, the Rhode Island Senate, and the New Jersey Assembly. 
there is a bill under consideration in the Rhode Island House, which we expect to pass in this session as well. Right now, as you all know, we are in an extremely desperate situation with regards to the possible danger of nuclear war. Um, before Ukraine, the experts were saying this was the worst moment we've been in since the Cold War, possibly worse. And then the Russians invaded Ukraine and have made uh, just a, a torrent of nuclear threats since then. Um, and it's really important that we build a movement in this country to counter that. The Back from the Brink campaign calls in the United States essentially to stop its opposition to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, to embrace the treaty and, the, uh, and support it, to recognize that this is a powerful, important, positive contribution to the effort to eliminate nuclear weapons, and to take the step necessary for the United States to advance the treaty process, which is to convene negotiations among all nine of the nuclear armed states for verifiable, enforceable time-bound agreement to eliminate their arsenals. Uh, as ICANN has uh, called in several uh, statements which is issued so far this year, this is the critical next step that needs to happen in the path towards nuclear abolition. And we are very grateful for ICANN's international support for this position that is the heart of the Back from the Brink campaign. Uh, Back from the Brink also calls in the United States to take some immediate intermediate steps that would lessen the danger of nuclear war while negotiations proceed and would give momentum, positive momentum to this process, specifically for the US to take its weapons off hair trigger alert, to end the no for to adopt a no first use policy, to end the policy whereby the president of the United States can launch nuclear war without anybody else intervening in the process, and to cancel the plan to spend about $1.7 trillion modernizing and enhancing every aspect of the nuclear arsenal. So I think that it, it would be enormously important if we could get the Massachusetts legislature to join the 20 odd municipalities in the state that have already endorsed this campaign. And it would help to build the kind of movement that we need to change US nuclear policy. Thank you so much. Um, our first speaker is has come back, Jonathan. Right. So uh, thank you, Ira. Thank you, Glenn. Um, it's uh, uh, an honor here to be able to welcome to Mass Peace Action, uh, Senator Mark uh, Pacheco, uh, the Senate's longest continuously serving member, and thus the Dean of the Massachusetts Senate, started his legislature career, uh, elected to the Taunton School Committee in 1980, and then was later elected to the House in 1988, and to the Senate from First Plymouth and Bristol, 1992. Besides, you know, serving and chairing on many uh, committees, uh, joint committees in the legislature, he's actually also active outside the state in the Council of State Governments, sits on the National Conference of State Legislatures Task Force on Energy Supply. I personally became aware of his efforts in the legislature 2006-2013 when he was the chief sponsor of the legislation to raise the debt minimum wage. Uh, and that's all you had to do. Uh, to more than 300,000 workers in the, in the Commonwealth. And throughout his career, he's uh, supported initiatives to spur job creation, economic growth, preserve the environment, uh, ensure protection of rights of veterans and citizens. Also very proud of his work on the Global Warming Solutions Act. And he will say a few words about some valuable, but perhaps buried history of Massachusetts legislative uh, initiatives. Senator Pacheco, um, you're, you're with us, please. Uh, you have to unmute, Senator. Unmute. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm uh, just, uh, unfortunately coming from a funeral and outside, uh, of a reception, uh, that I need to uh, get into. So I won't have that long, but I do want it to, uh, do want to address some of the issues relative to organizing and, and working on some of these issues that you are all talking about. I was asked to come on and talk a little bit about some of the strategies that were used over the years. And um, in particular, a couple that I personally was involved with, whether, we, whether you look at the whole effort that we worked on along with Byron Rushing, uh, in Boston when he was in the legislature uh, around uh, you know, South Africa and apartheid, 
or you look at the work that we did uh, along with uh, Antonio Cabral uh, from New Bedford and myself working on East Timor and the right of self-determination in that country, uh, Ramos Huerta, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, is now uh, the president of East Timor. And he was uh, he was the foreign minister in exile uh, in my office uh, many a day, having Dunkin' Donuts coffee and planning and organizing as to how we would uh, uh, get the need uh, for a self-determination vote on the UN agenda and on the, uh, then it was the Clinton administration agenda uh, to get the, uh, to get that action uh, taken care of. And we did that through legislation. We organized around legislation, getting the idea up there, out there, not so much to pass the bill, but to uh, ensure that we were having an organizing tool that could bring the issue uh, to the general public and have uh, committee meetings and committee hearings that could bring uh, what was taking place uh, uh, every day in, uh, in East Timor to the, uh, uh, to the public forefront. So uh, we did that when you go back to issues like tobacco, uh, you know, legislation and, and those types of uh, things that we had worked on. And uh, what we're working on now on, uh, on the state level is the whole divestment issue, divesting uh, from fossil fuels. So uh, working on whether it's human rights issues, civil rights issues, uh, public health issues, national security issues, that there are mechanisms in place that have worked successfully uh, to get on the national agenda, especially when you're working in concert with, uh, with other jurisdictions in the US and other jurisdictions uh, internationally. For example, when we were working on East Timor, uh, because of the relationship with, uh, with Portugal and East Timor uh, being a, a Portuguese speaking country as well, we worked with a lot of the Portuguese speaking countries in the world uh, dealing with the same issue. And we eventually got the UN uh, to take a position uh, in favor of self-determination. It wasn't too long after that, that the Clinton administration ended up supporting it. And then lo and behold, Indonesia finally uh, backed off and allowed uh, a self-determination vote. So, uh, you know, that's what I, I have to say that uh, this is all about organizing the, the, the hard work that you are all involved with. Uh, I was pleased to be involved with those issues. There are so many more things that, uh, that need to be done uh, uh, in the middle of a, a war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the issues there are uh, uh, quite complex and, and uh, disheartening to see the, uh, what is happening to uh, the Ukrainian people. Uh, the, uh, the work that needs to be done there is at, at multiple levels. But I wanted to uh, just say thank you for asking me to say a few words. And, uh, right. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, and we look Thanks, forward sir. to working together. Um, you know, as these as these issues move to the legislature. Thanks again. And... Yeah. Thank you very much. And and I guess Carol already wanted me to tell you that she will be joining you. She yes. she is just coming from another uh, another event, and uh, will be will be signing on. So gotcha. thank you. All, All right. right. Thank you. Bye right now. Glenn, back to you. Yes, I believe we now have Lindsay Sabadosa here. Um, is she is she here? I am indeed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we have Representative Lindsay Sabadosa here to discuss the um, Nuclear and Climate Commission bills. So Rep. Sabadosa, please take it away. 
Thank you. Well, I, I think I'm the opposite of Senator Pacheco today. I'm far less formal, but um, I think I'm in more appropriate Earth Day uh, attire and luckily I'm not attending a funeral this afternoon. Um, but it is a pleasure to be here with you to discuss this legislation. Um, I know that Timon is here as well and he can probably speak much more about this, but I, I'll give a, a little brief overview of where we are in the State House with the bill. Um, so this session, it is H738 um, and it is a res uh, an act providing for an investigation and study by a special commission relative to the existential threat um, posed by nuclear weapons and climate change to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will not be testing you on that afterwards. So if you didn't get the whole title, that's fine. I think we can just all call it the special commission bill and, and be done with that. Um, most legislators are familiar with it now, thanks to the very good work of many members of this group. I was scrolling through the names and I, I see people who have worked very hard to make sure legislators know about this. So this session, um, as you might have gathered from the title, there is more of a focus on the climate change aspect as well. This was done very strategically to try to give the bill a little bit more legs to try to tie it into different issues. Um, if you've attended any of the hearings and heard some of the testimony, that's always sort of been an undercurrent of the legislation that, you know, we should the whole um, I'm going to get it incorrectly now, but warheads to windmills that we should be focusing not on production of weapons, but production of um, technology that will move us towards solving the climate crisis. Again, tying into these Earth Day themes here. Um, the bill this time uh, has gone to the Committee on Emergency Pre Preparedness, which I think I rightly said is, is a nice committee, I think, for this. Uh, there's a very, uh, probably a more friendly chair this session, um, and the bill does have fewer committees, so we have have a little bit more of the attention of the chairs. That's not to say that we didn't do well last session. Uh, we got the bill all the way to House Ways and Means, which is really a tremendous feat. Um, of course, we didn't get it over the finish line, but I'm hoping that with the connection to climate change, we can move the bill forward like we did last session, but perhaps also be a little more successful in trying to tie it in with other pieces of legislation that are moving forward. So for example, uh, another climate bill, um, another bill that has anything to do with investments in climate, so maybe even something around economic development. Um, so that's the strategy for this session. We are a little light on co-sponsors starting out, although I think um, everyone was inundated with emails in the first few weeks and now with House budget, it is challenging to get people to pay attention, but luckily we still have the same rule where people can co-sponsor at any point. So I know after House budget and probably a little bit during the next uh, few days, then we're on the floor a lot. My goal is to, to chat a little more with people, to make sure it's on their radar, that they understand uh, that the bill has been refiled, what the new twist is, and to try to gain some more support but I'll also say number of co-sponsors, as you probably all know, does not make or break a bill. We got that bill to move forward last session, um, even without having 80 co-sponsors, and often bills with 80 co-sponsors don't go anywhere. So uh, it's really about talking to the right people who can help us move it forward, and uh, that is my goal, and I look forward to working with, uh, with many of you again to do that. So thank you for having me, and uh, as always, happy to answer any questions, although I, I know you have a great roundup of speakers today. All right, thank you so much. We do have, um, if we have time, we should have a few minutes for questions, assuming we can keep on track, but we do have one speaker who does have to leave at three, so we'll make sure there's plenty of time for that. Um, Representative Mike Conley, is is Mike Representative Mike Conley here? Yes, hello. Hello, good afternoon. Good How's afternoon, and a Yeti going? microphone. Oh, I have the same, is that a Yeti? Yeah, this I have, was my- I have the uh... same one. This was my Christmas gift to myself. Am I sounding good out there or what? I don't know. That is um, sound like a fully legit radio host right now. So good to go. Yeah. Well, we're coming to you live from the People's Republic of Cambridge here. <laughs> and um, it's great to see Rep Sabadoza and Rep Doherty. Um, it's good to see my constituent, Jonathan King, who lives about 100 yards uh, to my left. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you, Glenn, uh, for hosting us here. And it's good to see Cole. We were in downtown crossing last week, uh, for tax day, heard some great music, uh, and some great speeches. And, uh, yeah, I'm here to, to say a few words, uh, about our 
legislation and act relative to the divestment of state pension funds from nuclear weapons. Uh, it sounded like Senator uh, Pacheco uh, talked a little bit about history in Massachusetts, and certainly we have been a true leader um, on this concept and on this tactic of divestment. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about how in 1997, Governor Dukakis um, sort of started an effort in the 90s that sort of came to fruition in 1997 to divest our state pension funds from tobacco. Um, we just recently celebrated the life of the great representative uh, and community leader Mel King. And we know that uh, one of Mel King's uh, biggest accomplishments really was the push for divestment from South Africa, which he initiated in the 1970s in the state legislature. I think it took all the way until 82 to accomplish that. So we shouldn't get discouraged. You know, these things do take time uh, to finally build consensus. Uh, I was at uh, both the wake and the funeral for Mel. And one of the things we heard at the wake was that uh, Nelson Mandela, in deciding to come to Boston, uh, was really thinking about Mel King and the leadership he showed in the legislature to initiate the divestment um, from the apartheid regime. Uh, so it, it really comes full circle. Our legislature's also taken uh, steps to divest uh, from the Sudanese government and the atrocities that they were responsible in in Darfur. Uh, and of course, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, there was a divestment um, package signed by Governor Dukakis back in 1983 that targeted businesses that supplied uh, military hardware uh, in Northern Ireland. So there's a lot of different um, aspects to this notion of divestment. And really, I think we need to bring this tactic and this concept to bear uh, against the existential threat of nuclear weapons. You know, Rep. Sabadoza mentioned it's Earth Day. Uh, and so I don't know if you, I missed the beginning. I don't know if we intentionally planned this on Earth Day or not, but it's so relevant that we are talking about this on Earth Day. There's a great deal of sort of pure environmental climate advocacy that happens on this day as well it should, but really there are two existential threats that we face, climate change and nuclear annihilation. And when we think about um, the ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, and when we think about uh, some of the provocations on either side, uh, it, 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 you know, we, we are reminded that that doomsday clock has now been moved closer uh, to midnight than any time that I can remember. And so, I'm really hopeful that we can really build some focus in the legislature this term uh, on our entire peace agenda, especially this divestment bill. Uh, it's House Bill 2480. Uh, Senator Jamie Eldridge has filed uh, a Senate version, that's Senate Bill 1651. Uh, right now, we have several co-sponsors, uh, including uh, some of the representatives here in the room with us. So thank you for that. And um, I guess I'll leave it there and happy to answer any questions. Um, and, you know, just want to reiterate again that, you know, I, I think we really need to divest and move away from, you know, this, this nuclear um, predicament that we find ourselves in because, you know, we're not going to go forever without some sort of mistake, without some sort of misunderstanding, without some sort of provocation, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the chances of us going on indefinitely in the status quo is zero. So we have to um, step back from the brink and move away uh, from this nuclear posture um, around the world as soon as possible. So thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Um... Speaking of back from the brink, Ira is stepping out of the call, but he did leave his email in the chat for anyone else that wants to get involved uh, with his campaign um, for back for the brink to stop this horrible sense of nuclear annihilation. Um, and Timon, 
Tim is up next, if, and I see uh, he is in the room. Uh, hopefully he can be pinned to, yes, hello. Uh, Tim in, it, Tim in Wallace is executive director of Nuclear Ban US based in lovely Northampton and has been working across the state to build support for anti-nuclear weapon bills since they were first introduced in 2019. And he joins us now to discuss mobilizing and support for these bills. So thank you, Timon. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Mike Connolly and Ira Helfand and Lindsay Sabadosa. Um, we're we're um, very excited to be uh, working towards these bills. Um, I mean, we, I think all of us care about all the issues that are in the state house, but you know, we're, we're working especially on the nuclear bills and as mike said you know linking it with earth day and with the climate um so i just wanted to run down a little bit of our strategy and things that are coming up to try to build support for these bills um lindsay mentioned h3 uh, no, sorry 738 which is the house version of the nuclear and climate commission bill there is a senate version as well but um, we are we are currently putting our efforts into getting the the back from the brink resolution passed in the Senate. As you heard from Ira, uh, it's only in the Senate and not in the House. And so um, we're, we're concentrating our efforts there. We, we, we already have a majority of um, 43 oh. out of 80 senators who support the commission bill last time. So we know we have the support there. But uh, we want to get the the um, the back from the brink bill passed, and that needs um, support from around the state. The House bill, um, so that the Senate bill for back from the brink, just to remind you, is one four eight seven S S one four eight seven. The House bill H seven three eight for a commission is, as it was mentioned, currently in the Emergency Preparedness Committee, which um, Senator. Pachico is is one of the chairs of so we're hoping that he will support getting that out of committee again as it was last time in the other committee. Uh, but we need co sponsors we need Mike Connolly back on board as a co sponsor, along with others that has co sponsored it last time. Uh, and, um, and we need to build support around the state for these bills we have. Um, we have a webinar coming up on May 7th which is about the, the Warheads to Windmills campaign nationally, but it's also gonna focus on the, the state commission and we've got um, a breakout room about that. And so anybody who would, who is interested in, in more about, about the state commission um, should join that. We have um, a uh, lobby day in the, at the state house on May 23rd uh, for all these bills. And we'll be going door to door to, um, get co-sponsors and get uh, pledges of support for these bills on May 23rd. And we're already organizing car loads from Western Mass to come out to Boston. So I hope you can make it um, even more uh, representative from the Boston area. And we've got a, uh, a follow-up webinar uh, in June, on June 24th, looking at the Warheads to Windmills in more detail, looking at these links between the climate crisis and the nuclear weapons crisis and how we we can and have to address both of them um and the divestment that that mike Connolly was talking about is so important i mean that's our ultimately what we all want to see is the state divesting from nuclear weapons and from fossil fuels and and leading the way in this direction and um the only the only rationale for the commission bill originally was that um, you know we we don't we don't see any evidence that the state house is ready for these things yet and so it's kind of a no-brainer to set up a committee and look into it and come back with some recommendations uh, which we thought would be a no-brainer but it's even that's been hard work so um, we ha we do have groups all around the state we're setting up a war his twin mills coalition um, which already includes 350 Mass and Climate Action Now and some other climate groups, as well as local peace organizations and, of course, MAPA and um, various other affiliates to try to build support for these bills. And um, we have a strategy uh, back. Uh, we, were, we were hearing some of the history of these of these issues. And back in the 80s, um, Governor, yeah, it was Dukakis, Governor Dukakis, set up a um, governor's advisory committee on 
the impact of the nuclear arms race on the state of Massachusetts. And so if the governor can just set that up on their own, um, we are hoping we can maybe convince Governor Healy to do that. So that's part of our strategy. And um, we've talked to Senator Comerford about this, who has put the bill in the Senate. And um, she's, she's very willing to, to take this to the governor as soon as we have what she feels is, a, is enough support around the state for it. So our first priority is building, building this coalition and building a, a real solid basis of support. Uh, we have letters that people can write to try to get their 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 own reps and senators to to co-sponsor and sign on to these bills and mapa will be doing a lot more i know to um to, to, to mobilize people who support mapa around the state I mean, we have a lot of people and not just directly members but you know churches and synagogues and other faith communities and local groups progressive democrats you know indivisible groups we've got to mobilize these people to get support for the state house to do these um to pass these bills thanks thank you so much and we also have so just as a reminder if people look in the chat we have the may 7th webinar on warheads to windmills and to tentative date for our lobby day for these anti-nuclear weapon bills on tuesday may 23rd so be sure to sign up for that and you'll get more information from mapa along the way um <laughs> So that, and we still have some time for questions. Uh, we have um, at least a few minutes for any questions that um, may come up. We have, so if anyone, I don't think Ira is, any, is here anymore to talk about back from the brink, but we do have questions that if anyone has for the Nuclear Climate Commission with Lindsay Sabadosa or nuclear divestment with Mike Connolly or just building support and mobilizing support with our good old friend Timon. Um, I do think I saw some questions, Glenn, in the chat pop up as as people were talking. There might yes. be some there. Um, oh, I'm not sure I see them, but um, Alec, if you if you see them, can you let them? Can you let me know what they are? Sorry, that was my bad. I was <laughs> I didn't realize that was those were coming from the speakers themselves. Apologies. Oh, okay. Um, but people can definitely put them in the chat, right? If they want to ask questions or raise yes. their hands. Yes. I don't know if I got spotlighted here or what. But yeah, someone spotlighted you. I wasn't honestly sure how that happened, but I was like, oh, Mike's back. Way to go. I don't know how to undo it. If, if How do we undo it? Neither do I, but, you know, us. You're looking community. good. Don't worry. Community organizing on Zoom is a dynamic event, to put it mildly. Um, someone mentioned the conflict of interest travel loophole bill. Um, that's coming up. That's the next that's, section. So that's the next section. Come to that. Um, <clears throat> Kathleen Hamill mentions the special commission in the House bill and the special commission bill in the Senate. Um, I guess if we don't have any more specific questions, we could just give it over to Alec to mention our the bills that MAPA opposes. Um, Cole, do you think that's a good idea? No. Why don't we go to Why don't we go to Jonathan with the peace economy section? Eric, oh yes, that's a good idea. Erica yes. isn't here yet, but we can start with Jeff, and hopefully Erica will get here. She was promised for three forty two forty five. Excuse me, I have one question. Yes, um, and this would be for Timon. Um, Timon, just very briefly, could you uh, tell us, give us the highlights of what would be new in the uh, weapons to windmills uh, report that you're working on? What will be new in the report? Well, what I meant is uh, three years ago or so when your first one came out, your updating was my understanding, not just uh, reissuing. Yeah. And are there any quick highlights that you could um, let us know about? Uh, well, the quick highlights um, are that, um, you know, COVID happened right after our last report and that dropped global carbon emissions, which was great for the climate, but then they immediately jumped back again and they're, they're worse than ever. And, the, you know, as a bit, several people have already mentioned, the Ukraine war has not only 
raise the specter of nuclear war more than it's been in, 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 our, in our lifetimes, but it's also made the climate crisis considerably worse because of the boycott of you know, Russian gas, the explosion of the pipeline and all these things. So that, that's bad. Um, and the, the you know, nuclear program is going full speed ahead. I mean, we've never seen anything like the military budget that is now before Congress, you know, and has been going up and up and up um, astronomically, approaching one trillion dollars a year now with all the other bits and pieces added to it. So, you know, the situation is not getting better and um, and the need for addressing these two existential threats has never been greater. You know, we have to do this. And with the, you know, we, we analyze the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill that, you know, that have passed in the, in the previous Congress. And there are important steps, you know, forward in terms of, you know, more, more tax credits for solar panels and electric vehicles and so on, but it's not nearly, nearly enough. And as you probably saw yesterday or, uh, yeah, yesterday or the day before, um, Senator Markey and um, AOC relaunched their Green New Deal bill um, because, you know, we, we don't have enough. We, we, need, we need to work with these other countries, especially Russia and China. Um, and we need to put, you know, it's a, it's a moonshot effort that we have to put in to get, you know, to save this planet from climate catastrophe. And the fact that nuclear weapons are, are an even greater immediate danger, um, and we could use that money and all those, all those um, skills and technicians and scientists and engineers to put that towards the climate effort, um, not to mention the fact that, you know, all the, all the biggest carbon emitters in the world are pointing nuclear weapons at each other right now, US, Russia, China, India, the European Union. So th those are, that's what we're going to put in our report. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Um, oh, Patricia, are you, did you have more to say or? Very brief. I was appalled to read in the local newspaper that our two uh, senators uh, to Washington and Neil both were lauding the fact that F-35s are coming to Barnes Air, Air Force Base. Uh, and when those same technicians, many of them who work on those could be building windmills in this, in this state, but they were lauding it because of the economy uh, the benefits for the economy, as well as sort of pride in the state's capacity for uh, research, uh, MIT type research, technology research. We've seen we've seen a lot of examples where a lot of local economies across the country depend on funding the military industrial complex, uh, and that's a definitely a very deep problem we need to address as well. Um, and that's that's exactly what the kind of thing the commission is set up to to do. This. Yeah. So the Massachusetts Commission would look at all those issues. How yes. do we make this transition uh, that we have actually, to make? This is oh. a good uh, segue to the peace economy bills. It is an excellent segue. So Jonathan, why don't you take it from here? And can someone unpin us for? Right. So um, uh, as you've heard, uh, the notion that one can address these issues without speaking to the fact that millions and millions of people are concerned about their employment and paying their mortgage and paying for their health care and their schooling. Uh, you know, you ha we have to keep both sides of it there. So we, um, it's not easy to, to address, but um, the first bill we're going to talk about um, uh, focuses a little more on uh, military and policing and um, uh, the conflict of interest. And uh, we're happy to have a uh, rep uh, uh, Erica Uthoven from uh, so from some from primarily Somerville, is, uh, rapidly emerged as a leader in the state uh, uh, state legislature. Talk about it, and then Jeff Klein also will will fill in. Erica, you're on. Uh oh, you're driving. Pull I, up. Don't talk while you're driving. Yeah, I mean I can talk, but I'll have my uh, camera off if that's all right. Yeah, please. Not good? Drives us crazy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's why when I, I, I was trying to not accept the on <laughs> video, and then I was like, oh, okay. Um, but no, thank you all so much for having me. And I apologize. I'm a little triple book. I'm actually on my way driving um, to MCI in Framingham. And so, um, kind of related right to the military industrial complex that you all were just talking about. Um, you know, I believe that the prison industrial complex domestically here is intimately tied. 
um, to just the, the profit making off of, I mean, the complete traumatization, terrorization of, of people abroad, um, people of color uh, abroad and at home. So I just wanted to say thank you all so much for all of your work. Um, but I'm here today to speak um, specifically on uh, the bill around um, restricting, you know, in terms of what we're able to accept as um, politicians um, from lobbyists. And so just to take a step back, um, you know, we have actually pretty good laws. Um, you know, of course, anything can be better. But in Massachusetts, um, there is a lot of really good restrictions in place that prevents um, money from influencing right our decision. There, you know, there's a whole ethics commission that prevents sort of the tit for tat type uh, behavior. There is, you know, limitations on what lobbyists can give us. So anyone who is a registered lobbyist can't give me as an elected official more than fifty dollars a year. Of, of gifts and things like that, right? Because they're leg registered lobbyists. Um, and there's just one loophole to all of that. And that's what my um, bill that I filed and previously had filed with uh, Rep Robinson on, um, which is to essentially say, we need to close that loophole. It doesn't make sense that, you know, I'm able to not accept, um, you know, gifts greater than $50, but then I can have an all expense paid vacation and, you know, all, you know, hotel, airfare, um, to, you know, and I mean, I think the most prominent example of this is the trip to Israel. Um, there are also other trips that I'll, I'll raise as well, right? We've seen um, tech companies give free trips to legislators and politicians um, just for a free trip to see Mountain View. Um, then at the same time, right, they're let registered lobbyists and can push us to, you know, um, one way or the other on what we want to want a legislator fight for. And I think that's a real, real problem, particularly um, in terms of the influence of money in politics. Um, I will be clear that, you know, I do think that um, the money in politics issue is a really challenging one because even with these regulations in place, it's so difficult because, of course, you have the revolving door, you have networks, you have people that um, you know, can say, you know, I, you know, is going to get more of our time and more of our attention and to influence our decisions. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's at least very important for a start. And I think, you know, of course, preventing lobbyists from um, being able to give enormous gifts to legislators, as well as, of course, the campaign finance um, donation limit of $1,000. That's also extremely important. But there's more things we could be doing to really tighten up those laws and the influence of, of money. Um, in either the military industrial complex, in large corporations and corporate capture of our government. Um, and of course, um, as I mentioned, the, the prison industrial um, complex is also one that um, leverages a ton of influence on us elected. So um, happy to pass it over to my uh, co co host, I believe, and, and answer any questions anyone has. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Rep. Uh, okay, on the same bill, uh, let's move to uh, Jeff Klein, who is one of the forces behind it yeah just just to add um this bill only has two co-sponsors so far and i hope that the other uh reps and senators that are on this call or have been uh will add their names to this bill i mean basically it's a fairly obscure loophole to the strict uh, limits on taking money from lobbyists uh, and the law is is a little bit opaque uh, basically, this this bill would not stop uh, reps and senators from taking part in educational and cultural travel uh, financed by organizations which are not registered as lobbyists at the state house. Uh, technically, uh, the term is client. That is an organization which employs a lobbyist at the state house. Most of the international and national travel that reps undertake uh, don't fall under this uh, rubric. Uh, uh, and, you know, we think uh, education and cultural travel is uh, perfectly legitimate as long as it's not at the behest of organizations which will then come to lobby for specific legislation at the state house. Uh, so, uh, what's covered is uh, fairly restrictive. I know a lot of reps were nervous about this, reps who look forward to the ability and opportunity to do travel for educational purposes. Uh, that wouldn't be affected by this bill. Uh, to, to my mind, it, it's part of the move to make uh, our state government more transparent and accountable to the public and less accountable to money. And as Erica said, uh, the idea that uh, a rep can't accept 
a dinner worth $50 from a lobbyist, but can accept a trip uh, worth many thousands of dollars, and that this will have no effect in theory on their accessibility uh, to the interests of that lobbyist who pays for the trip, frankly, it's, it beggars belief. Uh, uh, this issue first came to our attention, as Erica said, because uh, one, if not the most uh, frequent user of this loophole are uh, lobbyists that uh, promote the interest of Israel in our state. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking at it more, looking into the issue more uh, uh, broadly, uh, there are other interests that pay for travel, like tech companies. Uh, representatives went to a, to a conference a couple of years ago on regulating uh, tech companies, which was paid for by Google and Facebook, for example. Uh, and uh, other reps went to uh, conferences on regulating gaming industry, which is paid for by casino operators, for example. But our focus has been on the Israel trips and dozens and dozens and dozens of members of our uh, state house have been involved in these trips. And we think this is a clear conflict of interest that uh, you know, should be stopped. As of now, in order to accept a trip uh, from yes, a lobbyist, a, a members of the legislature only has to assert that it's in the public interest. And that's all, uh, with no documentation. Of that. So, we think this is an important bill, and we hope that it'll get more co-sponsors. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Doherty, and uh, and uh, a few others who have uh, taken up this issue. Gotcha. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Rep. Erica. Uh, and we'll we'll be on the lookout to to add co-sponsors and to get support. Um, let me now move on to, <clears throat> uh, I believe, is Rep. Doherty with us? Carol, are you here? <clears throat> I can see me and you. Can you see me? Very good. All right. So the, ne uh, the next bill we'll talk right. about. Yeah. Budget transparency and taxpayers' right to know. Uh, Carol is a representative from, from Taunton following kind of in um, uh, Senator Pacheco's footsteps to some, some extent. You may not know that she was a former president of the Mass Teachers Association. Uh, all right. Carol, you want to kick us off on yeah. the tax page? Just uh, to connect with what you uh, said about for, uh, following in the senator's footsteps, when the senator first ran back in the day, uh, he and I were opponents of uh, the Democratic primary in that <laughs> in that race. So uh, once that was done and he carried on for a few years and then into the Senate, I stepped back for a little while. Um, but here I am. <laughs> Again, so thank you. Uh, by way of information, certainly Jonathan and I have known each other for that many years as well, uh, <laughs> meeting uh, around the Jobs with Peace campaign. Uh, and uh, Jonathan and company drew the Massachusetts Teachers Association into the Jobs with Peace campaign by adopting a resolution many, many years ago to support um, actions much like Mass Peace Action is initiating at this point. I don't know where the MTA is on on uh, creating resolutions and direction around this agenda, but uh, it certainly is in the interest of education and educators uh, to be able to do that on many pieces of the legislation that you are advocating. <clears throat> this particular bill, uh, House Number Three Hundred One Five, is a refile. Uh, modestly changed from last year, uh, last session's file. Last session, it was called an act providing federal and state budget information to residents of the Commonwealth. And it contained therein a requirement that, and when I, I get to tell you what this is all about, but it contained a requirement that information about the use of state and federal tax dollars would be mailed to each uh, resident in the Commonwealth, and uh, it was sent to the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight. It happened that Senator Pacheco was chair of that committee in the last session, so we were fortunate enough for him to give a good advice for some changes in that in the bill. So it is now, with its new number, called an Act to Promote Budget Transparency, being very clear about what the intention of the bill is and the public's right to know. And that really, I think, is a better way of saying you've got to tell the people how their tax dollar is being spent. 
Uh, so I, I'm I'm very much more comfortable with that title, uh, and it's much it's just clear and direct. There's no misinterpretation um, of what that is. The other change that uh, uh, Senator Pacheco, as chair of the Joint Committee, made uh, was for us to try to make it a, co a cost free to the Commonwealth to provide this information to people. And so simply changed one word from mail to website uh, so that the information would be put on the state's website at no cost so that we would be moving away from that argument. Oh yeah, we'd love to do it, but you know, mailing, printing and mailing is just an arduous task and very costly. So it was passed out of the committee with a favorable recommendation and did make it to Ways and Means as well end of the session clips right along. And so here we are again talking about this bill. Very briefly, for those of you who may not know what it is, it's simply put, this bill says to our state treasurer, uh, uh, on the state's website, you must provide information to the Commonwealth's residents that will give them uh, a sense of where they are, both their federal and state tax dollar is going. The whole point being, to have a, a better understanding among the populace that the vast majority of that dollar is fueling the military industrial complex, as has been pointed out, and not being dedicated to uh, the discretionary spending or the discretion that particularly at the congressional level that they have for housing, health care, uh, education, and all of those domestic issues that we consider to be more important to the populace than the military fueling the military industrial complex like you i've heard the argument but spending money on the military as you've just pointed out about these planes uh and the argument of our uh legislators at the federal level to say well this fuels the economy it brings jobs forward uh it and more money is put back into into the economy uh, but that's not the way in which we want our money our money to be spent. I think that the strategy that at least that we have talked about uh, with Jonathan particularly is to pull in those other organizations like the Teachers Union, for example. What, what does the transparency in uh, budget information and in tax, uh, the use of tax dollars, what does that do to the funding of education, for example? And I, I think about that. Um, particularly education, because right now, the federal government, fiscal 23, the federal government um, spends 7.7, .7, gives us back 7.7% of our state budget for education. The state pays 46% uh, of that uh, education funding and the local dollar, the property tax dollar, 40. 5.6%. So you can see, and that number, that little tiny minuscule sliver on a pie chart that the federal government pays for education alone is just so tiny and minuscule that it, it, it doesn't mean very much. And I think that we need to uh, provide that information to our taxpayers so that there can be more of a better way, a better understanding of the kind of advocacy we need in order to fully fund the programs that we consider to be meaningful uh, and important. So I'm, uh, even though Senator Pacheco is not the chair of the Joint Committee any longer, I'm looking forward to a positive recommendation out of this committee. So I think it was September of 21 when the hearing on the bill was held last time. So we will all keep our eye on the time when that bill comes up for a hearing and hopefully many of you will be able to provide a written testimony as well as a oral testimony as well. All right, thank you so much, uh, Rep Doherty, for that excellent summary. Um, I just can't resist adding, you know, we're a week past tax day, April 15th, April 17th. Every American knows all about the IRS and paying taxes, not paying taxes, fear of being audited. But in the 100 years since the adoption of the uh, uh, federal income tax, no agency of the federal government has ever reported back to the taxpayers uh, how much where their money goes. And Carol and I and Senator Petit Chico and many of us in peace action think if Americans knew that half the money they sent to, to, the, uh, to the federal government was going to the war and war machinery, it would change their attitude 
I'm not saying it would stop things, but it changed their attitude. All right, thank you very much. All right, our last peace economy bill deals the moral budget, the whole big picture. Uh, the Board Bills campaign uh, has introduced uh, into the Congress a, 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 a articulation of a moral budget that would raise 140 million people out of poverty. Um, and that's been transformed with the help of Rep. Livingstone into a, a budget bill for the uh, a moral budget for Massachusetts. Um, Jay, are you with us? Uh, Jay Livingstone is, did not make it. And so I think you should explain about the bill. All right. Uh, so um, uh, the moral budget um, is, you know, is an alternative budget compared to the one that Congress passes. The, the Congressional Progressive Caucus used to put in its own alternative budget. It was first called the uh, Budget for All, then the People's Budget, but they've stopped doing that. So a couple of years ago, the Poor People's Campaign entered into the breach and put in a moral budget, uh, which has a very different, you know, hundreds of billions less for military, uh, tens, of, tens of billions more for housing, education, healthcare. And that's been transformed into a moral budget for Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts, uh, which also kind of sets up a commission which would examine what would it mean for the Massachusetts economy if the US Congress passed the moral bu budget, right? So it's a way of doing public education around budget choices. Budget choices within the state are very, very obscure, but they're even more obscure in the federal budget. So again, this is part of the motion that Rep. Doherty talked about of, of making much more transparent what kind of choices are being made in the legislature, how our tax dollars are being spent both in the state and, and federally. And I hope that... Um, Actually, Rep. Livingstone just arrived. Ah, uh, hello, Jay. Can we? Uh, sorry, I guess my camera is very blurry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Looks like uh, you're in I a wanted you to say a few words about the value of having a, a moral budget bill uh, in the in the legislature. We can hear you. Okay. Great. Yeah, and we can vaguely see you. <laughs> Sorry. It's like you're in a fog bank, Jay. Yeah, it's um I, I use my phone and it it's the uh reverse camera angle on the phone. I need to clean it in some way. The fog represents the moral yeah. the moral fog of not being able to know the budget well enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, it's a uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry I'm a little late. Um, uh, distracted with some uh, personal things. The um, but I'm happy to file the moral budget bill uh, again this term. Uh, hopeful this term we can get it over the finish line. It, we were able to favorably move it uh, the last two terms, and hopefully this is the one we get it. And and what this bill does is it um, creates a commission to look at what would happen to Massachusetts if the federal government passed the moral budget so that we could better advocate at the federal level for uh, the moral budget, which would greatly enhance the social safety net um, and, and use basically use money that, that's uh, used for other purposes like the military uh, to um, enhance the social safety net. And so, um, my pitch in the legislature is, is that this bill really speaks to our values and shows us what kind of society we could have if we um, reprioritize federal spending. Right. Um, uh, people should know that uh, when we when Mass Peace Action originally decided to get involved in budget issues, it was, I think, back in 2013, and then we were supporting the budget for all uh, Rep. Livingstone was the person who came forward and brought forward the budget for all. And then when we went to the people's budget, the people's budget, and he has been a consistent uh, fighter for, you know, bringing some clarity and morality here. Okay, so that's for the, the peace economy. Uh, let me turn it back to Glenn for our closing session. Well, not, I don't think it's closing. Alex. Yes, Alec. Alec, are you with us? Alex, yeah. Yes, I am. Hi, thank you. Thank Welcome. you. 
Um, I will say we are also, I think, about 12, 13 minutes ahead. I just, we could probably open it up to questions, just a couple questions, one or two, right? If folks have any before we move on, we do have the time. Um, so if anybody has questions for any of the people that we've just heard from on the peace economy issues, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or write it down in the chat uh, and we can take those real quick. Otherwise, yes, we will move on. Let's give a few seconds for any shy people that may be hesitant to type. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, obviously uh, something like the uh, budget transparency, that should be coming from the US Congress, shouldn't be coming from a state. But we haven't been able to find champions in the US Congress. So we're hoping that passing such a bill in Massachusetts and then maybe over the next year or two, finding some supporters in a few other states to pass in those states budget transparency, taxpayers right to know, we can build up enough muscle to find a champion, for example, somewhere in the Progressive Caucus who will raise this in the, in the US Congress because that's where it ought to be. Going off of that point, a lot of these, a lot of bills that, I mean, state level bills tend to be sort of like, there's a whole theory about like, oh, state level bills are like, laboratories of democracy where things can start in practice it, you might say their laboratories is autocracy sometimes but um the idea is that like bills can start start in the state house and then once the federal level sees like oh that's a good idea then it can go up to the federal level um but people underestimate just how much of an impact state legislation has on their lives and on that um because it seems like no one has any questions. And if you do, do feel free to, to throw them in the chat just as we're going along. Um, I do want to reemphasize the point that, oh, Richard, yes, you have a question before we, before we move on. Are you able to unmute yourself or do we need to, I don't know how the permissions work. There he is. Okay, yeah, our whole congressional uh, Congress people, year after year, they vote for the uh, defense budget no matter what. And even uh, even when they add, uh, I think the Defense Department added another 60 billion onto the 800 plus billion. But every one of our, uh, both senators and every one of our Congress people, we're all Democrats, they keep voting uh, for the budget. They never ask for a cutback. Maybe we should drop a hundred billion dollars off and maybe we can use that hundred billion for these uh, programs domestically. But uh, I, I don't know, was Raytheon's got, uh, <laughs> did Raytheon uh, part of the problem that, that we have in this state in particular? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me just say, it's because of the truth of what you're saying that some of us decided, well, we better retreat back to the state legislature because we're certainly not making any progress in, in the US uh, Congress. So we find just finding ways to raise the issue and maybe just expose what 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 bad policy those votes are, but it's it's you know very frustrating, very disgust discouraging, and you're absolutely um, right on. But we we have to keep fighting. I wholeheartedly agree, and just think that we need more people like you, Richard, speaking out on to legislators and the public, saying that. Americans aren't okay with giving the Pentagon hundreds of billions of dollars of raises when they can't even account for over two trillion of it. They've failed their own audits. And it's it is sometimes it is demoralizing to put it lightly, but we do have but we just figure that if no if we ourselves aren't going to speak out against it then there are plenty of corporate lobbyists that work for the defense industry that are more than happy to step into whatever void that we may leave. So we just have to keep speaking out. And if the federal level isn't where the momentum is, then we have to reallocate towards the state level and vice versa. Um, that's what I will have to say on that. Do we have any other questions that you see, Alec? Or I just saw the one hand. Yeah. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll, add a, I'll add a comment on this also, Cole Harrison. Um, actually, uh, our two senators, Markey and Warren, and at least some of our reps, let's say Presley and McGovern, do vote to cut the Pentagon budget, but then they still vote to pass the whole thing after they lose the amendment. So they are 
No, there is a section of progressive legislators that are trying to cut the Pentagon budget, but they're not willing to lie down on the tracks and say, if you don't cut it, uh, you know, we're not going to give you your money. So that's that that kind of courage is what's needed. I um I'll I'll transition since uh, it seems that we don't have any other questions, but still on that topic, there have been interesting studies that show that overall, not only elected officials, but even individuals, the public generally perceive the American people as being more conservative than they actually are. Um, in terms of even saying is, oh, like, I would vote for that, absolutely, but oh, my neighbors wouldn't, right? My neighbors would never go for something like that, like reducing the Pentagon budget, when in reality, that isn't true. So I think a lot of these politicians at the national level and the higher up they go through the ranks are more and more scared of what they perceive as being kind of a uh, potential backlash against standing out against the military budget or something like that. And the importance of acting at the local level is being able to show that, no, we can do this, right? We can stand up against the, the incredible amount of money that goes to the Pentagon. And there aren't going to be political ramifications for our local politicians because that is what the people want, right? And that shows, that gives permission to, the, to these kind of national politicians to see that they can do that too, right? And they can do that without facing the political ramifications that they think they're going to face, um, at least is my take on it. And I think uh, at least in that regard, we've already heard from a lot of people today in our first section about how that can happen, right? In terms of divesting from tobacco um, and a, a whole bunch of other issues, right? And the importance of the state legislature and local uh, organizing in shaping that national consensus. So I think in a large way, it really can and does start right here in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and that's my take. And with that, um, I will say thank you to all the speakers that have that have gone so far. Jeff um, does has his hand raised. Uh, I oh. don't know if we want to, we still have a bit of time left. Really, really quick. Yeah, Jeff. So I just wanted to add, um, that many of you may think that uh, you know the consequences of this paid travel uh, are not don't have an effect in the real world. The fact is that the same uh, pro-Israel organizations that paid for these trips uh, moved in 2017 to punish supporters of boycotting and divestment of Israel, uh, which took an enormous amount of organizing to defeat at the state legislature. And as a kind of consolation prize, uh, the next session, uh, those same organizations asked for $500,000 to be appropriated to bolster Massachusetts-Israel trade relations. Israel is a very minor trading partner of Massachusetts. Uh, in the end, they passed $250,000 to promote Massachusetts-Israel, the only bill of any kind to promote foreign trade in the state legislature. It's not a huge amount of money, but still a quarter of a million dollars could have been spent in other ways. And in the current legislature, there's a move to uh, uh, make as a statute, a definition of, uh, of uh, anti-Semitism that would effectively punish criticism of Israel. And, and that's Jeff, we're, uh, we're, we're actually about to get House, that. House 1558. Jeff, uh, Jeff, so the same organizations that pay for this thousands of dollars worth of travel are coming to lobby our legislators on bills that they're interested in. So it's a clear conflict of interest. Well, all right, and then, then, then that is a perfect segue anyway into that bill that you were talking about, which we are about to get into, which um, I will then just say that we are going to hand it over to, we've heard about um, uh, the nuclear issues as well as how the state legislature can affect national policy. Of course, uh, peace economy issues as well. And now we're going to get into some bills that MAPA opposes. So that does include the bill that Je Jeff just touched on, uh, defining anti-Semitism. And to do that, we have Noble Larson, who is a member of MAPA's Palestine and Israel Working Group, uh, as well as a member of the JAG Coalition Group working to oppose this bill. Noble Larson, are you with us? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Alec. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the bill in question, uh, H 1558, uh, was submitted by Steve Howitt. He's a Republican rep from Seacock, Mass. Uh, it's titled the, uh, An Act Relative to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Definition of Antisemitism. And it would essentially uh, 
uh, put uh, define anti-Semitism as having the same meaning as endorsed by this International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. We'll call it the uh, IRA definition. That's what it's popularly called by those of us who are working on it. Uh, it's similar to one of many similar efforts around the country to codify the IRA definition into statute. Uh, the definition is a highly controversial political tool. Uh, it was developed essentially, uh, to my understanding, by the American Jewish Committee to counter and stop the widespread international criticism of Israel's violence against the Palestinians during the Second Intifada in 2000. The definition itself was drafted by the AJC's anti-Semitism expert, Kenneth uh, Stern, in the early 2000s and was promoted within the IRA uh, uh, organization. Uh, Kenneth Stern, interestingly, has subsequently become a strong critic of the misuse of the definition, particularly on college campuses, and has testified before Congress uh, to this effect. Uh, and has taken part in uh, webinars uh, on the uh, issue as well. The, uh, the definition in itself, uh, there are two components to what we call the IRA definition. There is the definition literally, which is an innocuous, in a way, a kind of vacuous definition of anti-Semitism being uh, a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Well, it's kind of defining it in terms of itself. And I don't think many would really object to that. Uh, uh, Avi uh, Schleim, the Israeli-British scholar, said that it fails to even meet the most elementary requirement of a definition, which is to define. So it's really not the problem in the definition. The problem is the examples that got added. And there were 11 examples that were uh, uh, basically, I, I think you would say, railroaded in, in a very problematical way. And these 11, 11 examples, uh, four of them are, I would say, uh, non-controversial, uh, but uh, the remaining seven are all about one way or the other about Israel. For example, de uh, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, for example, by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, uh, and uh, like that. Um, the, uh, the definition has been widely criticized. Uh, for example, a, a scholar at Oxford, uh, Jamie Stern Viner, uh, wrote a paper, I think two years ago, The Politics of a Definition, where he points out that uh, uh, Irish decision-making body, the plenary, did not uh, include any of the examples of anti-Semitism as part of its definition. There was no consensus within IRA for including the examples. And IRA, uh, their decision process is, at least was, uh, uh, one of a consensus method. Uh, so there was no consensus to include the examples. Uh, rather, what happened is afterwards, senior uh, IRA officials, or some, some of them, and pro-Israel groups have misrepresented the plenary's decision in order to, as Sternvi Sternviner put it, to smuggle into the working definition examples which can be used to protect Israel from criticism. The definition, uh, the IRA definition, has been adopted by more than 30 states and many city councils around the U.S. Uh, some of them, uh, and occasionally it's done as a proclamation. Uh, Governor Baker did that in January of last year. Proclamations aren't binding, so not too clear what those mean. Trump endorsed it in <clears throat> uh, the U.S. Uh, in 2019 uh, through an executive order. Yeah. It's been adopted by the U.S. Department of State and also by the U.S. Department of Education, <clears throat> which is kind of a special uh, concern. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, definition uh, as per the uh, Department of Education's uh, use has been used to silence Palestine solidarity efforts and educational programs on college campuses, uh, targeting uh, faculty, students at uh, Fordham University, UC Berkeley, University of Minnesota, uh, excuse me, of Michigan, uh, uh, Columbia, UMass Amherst, and quite a few others. Events have been canceled uh, uh, accordingly, and uh, similar incidents have uh, happened in com countries in Europe. So it's an international uh, thing, I must add. So a campaign has been organized through uh, uh, the coalition effort involving MAPA, JVP, uh, uh, you, you use uh, you know, uh, for justice in the Middle East and the Alliance for Water Justice in Palestine, which we uh, call the JAG. The JAG, I might mention, was organized uh, back in 2016-17 uh, 
to defeat the bill that Jeff mentioned a minute ago, uh, that was the anti-BDS bill. And uh, that was successfully uh, uh, blocked. <clears throat> the- uh, I'll ask you to wrap up pretty quick as I'll well Okay, Howitt's bill does not mention uh, the examples, uh, and uh, but that is no uh, consolation because they will be brought in uh, for sure one way or the other. So the main arguments are that it's, uh, uh, threatens three, free speech, and that it's really for for shielding Israel from criticism. Uh, the bill has been assigned to the Joint Committee on the Judiciary, and there'll be a public hearing at some time, uh, TBD. The current goal is to stop it in committee, uh, that is to have it put out to study. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Noble, very much. Uh, and again, everybody and anybody who's, who's interested in working on this bill, uh, Noble, can you let them know how, other than, of course, signing up through the link that we'll have in the chat, uh, how to get a hold of you or the group that you are working with this on? Uh, <laughs> I guess they could email me directly, but uh, I would say just email uh, to the MAPA general uh, email address and ask to have it forwarded to the working group, uh, to the Palestine Israel working group. I'm sure that can be done. Perfect. There we go. And again, the, the link is in the chat as well to sign up to work on any of these bills. Um, and I'm sure someone might have posted it recently again, if it, if it isn't already at the bottom of the chat. Noble, thank you very much. Um, and next, we are going to move on to um, Ed Hasbrook, who is an anti-draft organizer who himself has been jailed uh, in the 1980s for refusing to register for the draft. Ed, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to talk to you briefly about two bills, which uh, MAPA is, uh, thank you very much, opposing uh, H3296 and S2281. These are identical bills um, on both sides of the general court that would, uh, if enacted, uh, enlist and deputize the Registry of Motor Vehicles to act as enforcers for the selective service system in getting young men to register for a possible military draft. And if it sounds weird um, to get the registry involved in forcing the federal draft law, well, it is weird. Why, I want to talk a little bit about why this is happening and what's wrong with it. Why this is happening is because the feds are unable to enforce the law itself, and they are trying to get state governments enlisted to salvage a decades-old failed government program. I was the last person prosecuted in Massachusetts for refusing to register with the Selective Service System. That was in 1982. Uh, nobody has been prosecuted anywhere in the country in more than 35 years. And they were only able to prosecute me because I'd spoken out publicly and they could use my public statements against me. Um, at this point, compliance is very low. The former director of the Selective Service System testified at a national commission hearing a couple of years ago that the current database it would be less than useless for an actual draft. And so having don't not having the resources to actually prosecute people and people are supposed to not only register when they turn 18 but every time a man moves until they turn 26 they're supposed to notify the selective service system so they know where to find them if they want to draft them do you know anybody who has done that no of course not so it's a completely failed program but there hasn't been the political will in congress to acknowledge that uh, failure so they're turning to the states and many states although Many others have not have gone along and have gotten this to, to made draft registration with the feds a condition of getting a driver's license, even though it has nothing to do with a driver's license. Massachusetts is not alone, although it's one of the larger states. Um, it is joined in choosing not to get involved in this by New Jersey, Pennsylvania, California, the big one, uh, Oregon, and a number of others. But what's wrong with this? I mean, if Registration has failed and this isn't going to work. What's wrong with it aside from wasting money? One is that it's attempting to impose penalties on young men extrajudicially um, without giving them any chance to present whatever defenses they might have uh, against the legality of potential conscription for undeclared foreign wars, something that the general court has been on record against for 50 years. 
Um, and beyond that, um, I think there's an even more fundamental problem, which is the whole point of having the selective service system and a list of people which is perceived by military planners as showing that the draft is available as a fallback, a last ditch fallback, but a fallback nonetheless, is that draft registration and the availability of a draft emboldens military planners to contemplate more aggressive, more expansive, larger, longer wars without having to think about whether the people would actually be willing to fight those wars. And you know, as Daniel Ellsberg has said, uh, when I asked him about this an event a couple of years ago, the wars we've had without a draft have been bad, but they would have been even worse had there been a draft um, available and enacted. So taking draft registration off the tool, out of the, the toolbox, uh, the arsenal of weaponry of the military is an important way that we can constrain um, military planning. And we've talked a bit in this session about what can the state do because the federal government has admitted that they depend on state driver's license agencies to enforce draft registration. This is a place where the state can actually wield power to constrain federal military policy. It's a good thing that Massachusetts has not got involved in having the registry enforced draft registration. That should continue. Oppose H3296 and S2281 or any attempt to insert that language into any uh, omnibus bills, which may happen. Thank you. Ed, thank you very much. Um, well, that concludes our speakers. So thank you to everyone who has spoken today. Uh, we now do have some time for questions. Um, while people are raising their hands or writing their questions down in the chat, if they have any for any of the speakers that, are, that we've had today that might still be here, um, or about any of the bills, right, which we do, of course, have folks here, no matter what, who can answer those questions. Uh, please do remember, again, it is imperative that we have the people, uh, the people power to be able to oppose these bills or uh, support the, the bills we talked about previously. So go ahead and please do click on that link. Uh, let us know what bills you're interested in working on, right, what you believe that you can do to help. Uh, and that will help us immensely in organizing around these bills going forward. I see, Jonathan, you have your hand up. Well, I, I think that this last bill we just heard about um, is so connected to the peace action agenda that we ought to actually formally include it in our, um, you know, legislative agenda, which requires a vote by our legislature. So, Ed, you should bring this to our legislative committee. Glenn Cody is the co-chair. There's a whole procedure. We're very careful about these these kind of things. But I, I think this was- Actually, I can update on this a little bit. We actually did have a struggle about this bill in the last session when they tried to attach it to a, as an amendment to a bill. And we had a, we actually formed a committee. Uh, we brought in both Ed, but also a couple of other uh, national anti-draft advocates who, who are aware of this whole issue and gave us some advice, one of which, um, uh, anyway, but um, we, the group at that time felt it was the best strategy not to publicize our opposition to the bill until the other side made a, made a move first. So for at, at this time, both for this bill and for the anti-Semitism anti definition bill, MAPA hasn't put anything on the website because we're waiting for the right moment. Uh, and even for the anti-Semitism, we're also working in coalition with JVP and others. But yes, we 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 have, you know, the, neither of these bills are new to MAP because we've had them in previous sessions in different flavors. So yes, we already have taken that position. Thanks. Good. Ed, you have your hand up, please. Yeah, I just would note that um, at the federal level, there have been efforts. There was a bill introduced in the last two sessions of Congress to actually finally, after these decades of failure, repeal selective service registration and abolish the selective service system. Uh, that bill was an, uh, has been endorsed by National Peace Action, as well as the National Organization of Women, AFSC, Vets for Peace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are looking, if anybody has a uh, federal uh, legislative context, we're looking for sponsors to reintroduce that bill uh, in, in a future uh, future Congress. Good. Thank so you. we can just change back to gallery view so everybody can see each other and uh, we can change to more of an open discussion format now.
it looks like we still have five people pinned. Uh, I'm not sure how to unpin them. But... Oh, okay. Let me unpin them. Hey, uh, Ed, I would uh, make one comment myself. Uh, having uh, tangled with the draft myself many, many years ago, I do remember that in the 60s, it was the, uh, the draft which really drove the anti-war movement. And when you don't have a draft, you know, so many people just think it's not their problem. You know, the uh, the uh, working class folks will they'll it'll you know be drawn from that demographic. Uh, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of of two minds in a sense. I, again, I think you know what is most influential. One. Many older people are willing to sacrifice young people's lives. It doesn't impact everybody. It only impacts the young. And the second thing, though, is you know, the testimony that we heard, particularly at the National Commission that was looking into what to do about selective service, was so clear that they rely on the assumption that the draft is available as a, you know, a, a pillar of their military planning that really, I think it's very clear that the getting rid of selective service would, you know, kick one of the legs out from under um, those military plans and force some degree of assessment um, as to the degree of, of popular support as, you know, basically draft registration is a blank check for future wars and military planners interpret it that way, I think. Paul, is there anything else we should discuss before we remind people of all our wonderful events coming up? I think if there's no no more comments, we can we can do that reminder. Glenn. Yes. Uh, so we in the chat, you should see Cole just mess just wrote um, some links that we have, but for your for the things that you should have on your schedule, uh, the May 7th webinar on warheads to windmills and the tentative date for our first anti-nuclear weapon lobby day uh, is Tuesday, May 23rd. Um, and you can sign up to get email uh, reminders on that. And is there anything else that we should mention? And most important, we want we'd like everyone here, please, to sign up on this form that I put in the chat indicating your interest in working on this, uh, indicating which bills are most important to you, one, and two, what kinds of things you are able to do to work for those bills. For example, will you contact your legislators? Will you attend a lobby day on May 23rd, if, if it works out? Will you testify at the hearing? As you know, each bill will come up for a hearing at some point this year. And will you join a committee to plan the work on that bill? So that's what we're hoping you will volunteer to do by signing up. Well, I see Jay has his hand up. Yeah, I, I fixed my camera. I just wanted to say hi to everyone in person, <laughs> but also um, really uh, thank you for, for this forum. Uh, thanks for supporting my bill in particular, but also this has been very informative, not only for what the, the positive agenda, but also uh, the bills that you have concerns about. And so I, I appreciate it. And you know, Cole just did the call to action um, for how much you're gonna be involved. Legislators like myself definitely respond to our constituents. And so it, if whoever you represent, your Senator, your, your representative, uh, definitely I encourage you to reach out to them on, on the bills that you're most interested in and most concerned about, because that, that is gonna make the biggest difference in their decision-making. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, and just to amplify that, you know, we held an earlier session a couple of weeks ago with three experienced state house advocates, and they were loud and clear that to pass these bills, we've got to have people in every state house district contact their reps, right? Reps have a lot of bills on their table, thousands of bills. To get it, to pull it out of the pile, we have to have somebody, one of their constituents, contact that person. So we have to build our network across the state and that's what this is about. Okay, end of sermon. All right. Okay. Oh, Go ahead, John. Is, is, is gonna lead the way. Once oh. again, 
as in the tobacco fight and the apartheid fight. And all of you are the front line, front line troops and need to recruit the cooks and the bottle washers uh, that will come in behind. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming.